Our keynote speaker, Dr. James Blair, is director of the Center of Neurobehavioral Research at Boys Town National Research Hospital. Dr. Blair is an internationally renowned expert on the cognitive neuroscience of psychopathology, particularly with respect to aggression, violence, and psychopathy. He has published over 200 scientific manuscripts on these and diverse other basic neuroscience and psychiatric issues. Dr. Blair received a doctorate in psychology from University College London in 1993. Following graduation, he was awarded a Wellcome Trust Mental Health Research Fellowship that he held at the Medical Research Council Cognitive Development Unit. Subsequently, he moved to the Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, University College London, where he helped form and co-lead the Developmental Disorders Group. Moving to the United States in 2002, he joined NIMH Intramural Research Program, where he was chief of the section on affective cognitive neuroscience until 2016. Dr. Blair's primary research interests involve understanding the neurocognitive systems underlying psychopathology, particularly for disruptive behavior, anxiety, and mood disorders. Dr. Blair is also interested in the effects of substance use and trauma on neurocognitive functioning and psychopathology. His research approach includes techniques employed in cognitive neuroscience, including both neuropsychology and functional MRI. Let's give a warm Southwestern welcome to Dr. James Blair. So thanks very much. Can I, am I hearable? I, I'm not sure whether I muted myself, so I clearly, and the trouble is I've got a very loud voice anyway, so even if I did mute myself, I'm probably still audible. But anyway, so here we go. Let's, uh, let's see that this works. Yep. So, it's a great pleasure to be here. You have a quite excellent campus, and uh, as you heard, uh, um, Laura is one of your, um, well, uh, previously come through the system here, and we have somebody else who's joining us next, uh, next year. So we have a, a, a burgeoning relationship with Georgetown, Texas, so it's a great pleasure to be here. So, uh, and may this relationship continue. So I'm going to be talking about a little bit about trauma, a little bit about hyperthreat sensitivity, which was one of the questions we just heard, and a little bit about reactive aggression, which we'll, we'll go into. Basic plan, I'm going to take you a tiny little bit, tell you a tiny little about Boys Town, where we are now, and why we are there now, uh, before going into just a way that we describe the phenomena um, at multiple levels of analysis, before a couple of studies just illustrating some findings and, and then concluding with why we're going after this sort of information. So, Boys Town itself is a large residential treatment center in Omaha, Nebraska. There's roughly about 400 youth go into the Boys Town program each year, and although it's called Boys Town, 40% of the kids that go in there are, uh, are female. Each child that goes in there is usually in for around about a 12-month period. From the data that they've collected, they find that the effects of the uh, residential treatment program are not so effective if you have been there less than nine months. If you're there over nine months or longer, then you tend to see um, maximum efficacy. The type of, it's a very psychosocial focus to the intervention. The children in these sort of group homes are about eight to 10 people. Um, they are, um, there's a family teacher who lives in the home with, the, with their spouse and um, provides sort of constant care. It's basically a family environment to children who've really not had that sort of family environment to, or at least to have issues with their family environments before. And in fact, actually, in, you know, nicely echoing uh, Rachel's talk, you're giving all those sort of supportive um, um, environments that, as she was outlining, are so important for um, uh, the developing child. Although the average age that's coming in here is um, obviously much older than the children that um, uh, Rachel was talking about. We're talking from 10 to about 17. Most of them are um, slightly over the age of 14. There is also psychiatric input. Um, most of the children, in fact, all of the children will see a psychiatrist at some point, uh, usually on their arrival. There's also um, uh, a number of other boys' town centers around about the country, um, uh, serving um, somewhere in the region of 10,000 um, youth per year. And, um, and, uh, and so one of the features that I found so attractive about the move, I was up, as, as you just heard, I was at NIMH um, up to the last six months ago. 
I moved because I'm hoping the basic work that we were doing in NIMH can now be translated into assessment tools and into techniques that will help develop new interventions so that we can actually start doing some good as opposed to the, the, just the basic science. And the great opportunity, as far as I saw it, with respect to Boys Town, is not only can we work really tightly and well with the kids on campus of Boys Town, but anything useful that we can discover can then be not only propagated for the immediate environment, but for all the other um, uh, Boys Towns, so it's pretty well scattered across the country. And also there are a large number of independent clinicians who follow various forms of Boys Town methodology. So if we can do something that's good, if we can do something useful, we can propagate that information um, uh, um, uh, very rapidly and very helpfully. Now one of the reasons why I'm so bothered about the situation now, why I focus on neurobiology, is because in some respects the situation with respect to mental health is diabolical right now. It's really, really almost dark ages stuff. If you go to a mental health professional, you will be asked what you're feeling or what you're experiencing. And maybe your caregiver, your parent, or somebody else who's working will be asked as well. It will be purely based on what you or somebody else says about what's going on. And if you imagine you went, so let's just change it around. You've, gone, you've got a horrible stomachache. You go to your um, uh, physician. You go to the physician, the physician says, how are you feeling? You say you've got a stomachache. And he says, or she says, well, what, tell me about that stomachache. Is it intense? Is it minor? Is it, and then leaves it at that. Does not do anything else that other you about your own opinion about your stomachache. You would not be very happy in this situation. You want a blood test. You want to know, is it an ulcer? Is it cancer? Is it something else that's horrible? You want to know, is it just indigestion? Are you pregnant? Any of these things would be useful <laughs> things to know. Just being told that you have stomachache disorder because you're complaining about having a stomachache would not be very informative to you. But the diagnosis of conduct disorder and many of the other psychiatric diagnoses are just like that. Conduct disorder is conduct disorder because you're doing bad behavior. ADHD is ADHD because you're running around in the classroom. It's based around what behavior you're showing in front of the person and based about what you or somebody else is saying that you're, you're anxious, you've got an anxiety disorder because you're expressing anxiety. I want to be in a situation where we can provide um, objective, biologically based measures, so we say that this particular set of systems is not working well in this particular uh, individual, and therefore by this type of intervention we can remedy that specific problem. That's what I want us to be able to do for mental health, as we do with other areas of um, medicine. And so. That's my little preach for the day, but that's what I want to do. If I can do some of this, I will die happy. I won't be very happy because I don't want to die, but I will at least know that I had a purpose. So, um, so uh, there you go. So this is just to give you some of these. Now back to the diagnosis. These are the sorts of kids that we see in Boys Town, the sorts of um, problems that are facing many of the children we see in Boys Town. Uh, very high rates of ADHD, very high rates of conduct problems, um, ODD and CD. Uh, um, then you've got depression, MDD, various forms of anxiety disorder. So a lot of anxiety, a lot of disruptive behavior, a lot of ADHD in the population. The other problem that you see very extensively is high levels of abuse in the children before they've arrived. Maltreatment and physical and sexual abuse, so neglect as well as physical and sexual abuse. Um, one of the very strange features about being at NIMH is that you are constrained quite vigorously as to what you can investigate. I could not investigate work on uh, maltreatment because if I found any maltreatment, I had to do something about it, and I didn't have access to the clinical resources that would enable me to do something about it. So we were in this really weird situation of basically telling everybody coming in, please, please, please don't tell us anything about your maltreatment, because then we have to do something, we don't have the facilities to do it. And given the fact that maltreatment is one of the major risk factors, again, you sort of heard with Rachel, but certainly one of the major risk factors into all the problems we're talking about, it's a very unfortunate situation situation to be in. We can also talk about substance abuse either because substance abuse is to do with NIDA and we were mental health and mental health wasn't allowed to do substance abuse because that was NIDA. So it's a very odd environment to be in. 
We're no longer in that environment. Now we're at Boys Town, we can basically talk about boy, um, abuse, we can talk about trauma, and we have access to the clinical resources to do something or at least to get it addressed as, as soon as it happens. And in fact, probably once every couple of weeks, certainly two or three times a month, we encounter a child who reports um, uh, experience of abuse that we will have to do something about and um, um, uh, uh, um, get notified to the, to the, to the various um, um, authorities or, or have somebody intervene. Second thing I should say, this is the scanner. We've heard a little bit from uh, uh, Laura. You lie in the scanner. This basically allows with us to identify which regions of your brain are using the most amount of blood, and those regions of your brain moving the most amount of blood, and those regions of the brain doing the most amount of effort. The Boys Town Scanner, it's very new, it came in uh, uh, beginning of last year. Absolutely delicious example of what a scanner can be. It's aesthetically pleasing, it's relaxing, it's basically almost a womb-like environment. <laughs> this is very unlike the NIH one, which was in the bowels of, NI of the NIH building. You had to go down this long corridor to get to it. That wouldn't have been too bad, apart from the fact it was littered with cockroaches. If you looked up, you would see cockroaches every other time, at least. And not tiny little cockroaches, but good, healthy, robust, <laughs> steroid-eating cockroaches that were, were proud to call themselves cockroaches. So if you go to NIH, make sure you don't eat in the canteen, or if you do, at least um, uh, feel, you know, take some antibiotics afterwards. So that's the scanner. Uh, ooh. There we go. So indeed, so what we're trying to do, what our goal, superordinate goal, is to use neurobiology to provide individualized assessment tools. And I'm going to illustrate, as we go through, some of the problems of just relying on surface features, on just relying on what people say. What we do is very these schematics to allow us. We're imagining that uh, you know here we have just the cognitive level types of problems, types of computational problems, types of things that an individual can't do very well. So empathic problems, problems in threat responding, problems in decision making, or aspects of decision making, and then we can examine what the behavioural consequences, developmental behavioural consequences of those problems are, and what their neural underpinnings are. So. What you just heard from Laura was um, the importance of the amygdala. When the amygdala is reduced and responding, we see these two um, associated issues. We see problems with um, uh, um, animacy and some of the social um, uh, consequences of that. And then we also see problems <coughs> with empathy, with being bothered by another individual's distress. And if you're not bothered by another individual's distress, you're significantly less bothered, you're much more able to use aggression in order to meet your goals. You can indeed uh, point a gun in somebody's face and demand their wallet because you really don't care how, how bothered you are. One of the most uh, dramatic examples, lots of people engage in mugging, not necessarily, you know, you can point a knife and not necessarily use it. But one of the um, best cases I saw of an individual with psychopathy back in the UK was this guy who just decided that that was way too inconvenient. Sometimes people fought back, sometimes they ran away and he had to chase them. It was generally a really irritating way to go. So what he did instead was grab a brick, come up behind people, smash them on the back of the head. As you can imagine, the consequences for the people he did this for were really dramatically bad. Um, and, uh, you know, given the money involved, was really, really totally inadequate um, uh, way of, of, doing the, of doing things. It was even from his point of view deeply uncunning because there were loads of muggers in this area of London called King's Cross. It's a very nice area now, so if you go to London, you could be happy to go to King's Cross. <laughs> 20 years ago, you never wanted to go to King's Cross unless you wanted to do various nefarious activities or alternatively get mugged. So 20 years ago, very bad area, loads of muggers there. But I can tell you the police very rapidly zeroed down on the guy that was using um, a brick. So badly consequences for him as well as for um, um, his victims. And when I try and imagine some, the, what we heard before about the CU traits, what it's like to be an individual with CU traits, I would just say, if I told you this was worth $100 million, you should all, every single person in this room should want to steal this, if you believe me at least, um, uh, in order to get the $100 million. If you feel that you're sitting there and don't want the $100 million, there's probably something wrong with you. Uh, or you've already got $100 million. So, I mean, the rewards are so massive and the costs are so small. You can buy the university another one tomorrow and still have most of that $100 million. If I told you you had to use this to scoop my eye out, 
I would like to believe you're not so rushing forward to grab this thing in order. It's just horrible. You're going to have to imagine the pain. You might have, my, my kidneys are going to be upset. It's all generally undesirable. So the idea of how we imagine somebody with CU is responding, is like you were thinking for the first example, but for the second example. But now I'm going to flip. That was just sort of recap uh, from before. I'm totally going to, re uh, uh, to flip to what we heard, I think, in one of the questions at the, uh, the tail end of Laura's ta uh, talk. There's no doubt about it. Many individuals who show antisocial behavior, many children who show higher levels of conduct problems, don't have this re reduced threat response. Instead, they show high levels of anxiety. And one of the things that, that where I got straight interested in this is because you have people with the same diagnosis, one of which is this really unanxious, unempathic individual who's just not bothered. And another child receiving the very same diagnosis is highly anxious, showing all of these sorts of um, uh, problems. And at the neural level, as we're going to go into, you've heard about in the case of the children that Laura was talking about, reduced amygdala response, really flatline reduced amygdala response. Whereas we can have other children with antisocial behavior who have these heightened, very strong amygdala responses. And obviously, if we've got two different kiddies with the same diagnosis, but totally different underlying pathophysiology, we must treat them differently. If we treat them the same way, we're gonna help maybe one of them, but really not help the other. And so that is why I'm so you know, focused on this neurobiological approach. I'm trying to speed up now. So we're going to be talking about increased basic threat responsive circuitry. This is the circuitry that does your basic response to threat. The amygdala, the hypothalamus, the periaqueductal gray. If you were a mouse, if you're a cat, if you're a dog, if you're you, that is, those are the brain systems that allow you to respond at a very basic level to threat. If we had a tiger come in the room right now, in that corner over there, Travis is, uh, everybody's right on top of it, the, the thing, the tiger would be right on top of you already. So we're just gonna pretend you in the corner don't exist. We talk about the people over here. You see the tiger in the corner, the first thing you do is you freeze in the hope that the tiger will notice somebody else and then you won't get eaten. The next thing this brain circuitry tries to do is to make you run as fast as possible for the exit. The last thing this brain circuitry does, you're cornered here, the tiger's on top of you, cat just pounces, you go down fighting. Your, this very brain, basic brain circuit will at least attempt. You won't win, but you will attempt to fight the tiger. It will all end up badly, but it will still be, you, this is what your brain system will do. This is what this stuff system does. The reason why this is important is it means that if this circuitry is overly responsive, if this system is too responsive, an individual who might freeze at a threat will lash out at the threat instead. And should you want a really, the best example I've ever seen this is if you look on YouTube and um, look up Man Punches Snowman. So these pranksters were basically doing this business of having a snowman, uh, dressed, one of them was dressed as a snowman on a boardwalk in somewhere or other. And uh, when people would go up to the snowman, the snowman would suddenly orientate towards them. The healthy response in these circumstances is to freeze or to back off. That's what the, the, health, your health, the healthy brain is telling you to do. This one quite large guy with a, with a, a noticeable haircut um, <laughs> just lashes out at the, uh, the he's not trying to um, punch the snowman. It's particularly unfortunate because there's a very small girl on the other side of the snowman who gets squashed by the falling snowman. It's terribly funny if you just ignore the fact that there's a small girl being squashed. So, um, so uh, if you don't take anything else from this um, talk, at least go look up a YouTube man punches snowman. You will see reactive aggression in its uh, finer uh, glory. But he, you can see the other movies here, you can see what the most people do when this sort of threat stimulus comes in. And I'm assuming that this guy had had um, you know, some degree of threat level that was uh, leading him to, to, to lash out in this particular way. So we can show, show the biology in um, healthy individuals. This was a particular, this wasn't one of my studies, but uh, this guy called Mobs, I, it's absolutely a delicious study. They had people in the scanner, and it looked when you were in the scanner as if there was a tarantula coming towards your foot. So you were shown a video that was apparently your foot, and there was a tarantula coming either towards or away from. It was um, an ancestor of the looming paradigm that, uh, that Laura showed you just before. When you, um, as that tarantula comes towards your foot, the closer and closer it comes towards your foot, the more this basic threat circuitry comes in. The amygdala you can't see, but hypothalamus and then PAG gets more and more strongly active. 
We would love to do this sort of study, except for it would be deeply unethical, so we don't do anything like that, which is why um, we do the paradigm like uh, Laura was describing, but it shows the system really strongly responding. So that's the basic uh, neural level. That's the basic um, um, uh, problem, the issue of trauma um, and what trauma is doing to the brain. It's been strongly suggested for quite some time that previous experience of trauma, neglect perhaps, but certainly physical and sexual abuse, is going to give rise to a problem where you see increased amygdala responsiveness. So we wanted to investigate this with the, uh, in the youth with Boys Town, at Boys Town. Um, and uh, we did this um, 95 adolescents, 36 who have experienced significant trauma. So they all scored over 41, which is one of the cutoffs that you use as a, on the CTQ, this child trauma questionnaire, is a cutoff for pretty serious levels of trauma that the children has experienced, or maltreatment the child has experienced both levels of abuse and also neglect. And then we had another group, 49, who hadn't. And that you basically, the lowest score you can get on the scale is 25. So our, our, our typically developing youths, our non-traumatized youths, really had not experienced uh, very much trauma. Then, of course, age, IQ, gender match, just, uh, just to get that out of the way. Age ranges from 10 to 17, but they're mostly over the age of 14. An average IQ of both groups is around about 95, and 65% male. And the task is this one, the effective Stroop task. You have trials that might just involve you looking at emotional pictures uh, or neutral pictures and you don't have to do anything. But then there are trials where you have to actually do, you see a picture, then you have to count the number of numbers before you see the other picture. And you have two different levels of the task. Congruent trials counting five fives. Both um, there's five and the, but, you know, the number of fives and the uh, numeral match up with the same response. And incongruent trials that are slightly bit more difficult, four fives, because the sources of information don't match. And what you see is the implications of trauma. So we had got some degree of suggestion that indeed trauma was increasing amygdala responsiveness, and we very clearly document that in this population here all over again. That's the top slide over there. Uh, uh, over there. But trauma has really profound bad effects on the developing brain. You sort of saw it at a, at a, in, in the context of the, of the data Rachel was showing, um, uh, behaviorally, and here you see it um, uh, at a brain level. It's this, these other systems, all these systems we're talking about down here, so these sort of um, frontal areas, lateral frontal areas, dorsal median areas, and then motor cortex as well. These areas are really important for response control, for making sure that you're not impulsive in your motor behaviors. Children with ADHD show problems in the recruitment of these regions. The less that you recruit these regions, the more impulsive behavior you'll show. So what we're seeing in these data is not just that trauma, increasing levels of trauma, is devastating the impact of amygdala development and leading to hyper threat sensitivity, but it has profound other consequences as well, which are only just beginning to be documented. This hasn't been documented previously, but was very clearly um, seen here. So, you know, trauma, whether it's in fact so far with the data, it doesn't really matter whether it's neglect or, or, or abuse, possibly because the correlation of these two is so very high. Um, uh, uh, having these devastating effects across core neural circuits. So we just talked about trauma and the involvement of the uh, hypothalamus PAG. We're now very briefly going to see one particular developmental behavioral consequence and this circuitry mediating this behavioral consequence um, to do with reactive aggression. So the whole argument was if an individual is at increased risk for reactive aggression, then we should see heightened activity in the amygdala PAG circuitry. Oops. And uh, we did that through a, um, a paradigm. We can't obviously, of course, look at reactive aggression per se. So we have to look at a sort of analog for reactive aggression in the, tar in the scanner. Um, um, and we chose for this a retaliation paradigm. So in the paradigm, all you had to do was, oops, uh, just, I'll go straight into the paradigm. All you had to do was you were playing against what was supposedly a partner. And the partner could give you a share of $20. They could be nice and give you $10 and keep $10 to themselves. Or they could be progressively ne less nice, including keeping $18 for themselves and only giving you two. So, uh, one of the great things about unfair allocations is they're amazingly irritating. So, you know, as you will probably know, if you were in a situation recently where you asked to share with somebody else and you don't share, 
Certainly in academic context, the vicious fights you get in boardrooms about unfair allocation of resources are, are famous in their intensity. But in your own existences, you'll be, you know, it's an incredibly provoking event to have an unfair allocation of resources. It's um, associated with incredible anger and often retaliation. And we, in this paradigm, offered all the children the possibility of retaliating. So each trial, they were given $3, and they could spend, they could either keep $3, or they could spend $1, 2 or $3 to take $7 for each dollar they spent away from their competitor. So in other words, if they spent all $3, they could take away $20, $21, which was all the money, and then some from their competitor. So they had the chance to retaliate. Now what you see is children with uh, DBD are more likely to retaliate than healthy children, although everybody retaliates when they're only given 18, um, uh, when only given two and the other person keeps 18. So the top data, those are from that study with the um, spider, where we are activating that basic threat circuitry by an approaching threat. Bottom slide is from um, humans, adult humans, um, uh, doing this provocation task and showing the more that you activate this basic threat circuitry, the more that you um, retaliate. So the more that you fight back, the more that you punish the other person, the more that you retaliate, the greater you show activation of PAG and amygdala, which is not, um, um, not depicted here. The other thing to note is this region just above the eyes, this region of ventral medial prefrontal cortex. This region is really important. This region allows you to represent how good or how bad your choices are. So if you're going to make a good choice, if you're going to get loads of reward, there's loads of activation in this region. If you're making a bad choice and something's going wrong, then you're going to see decreased activation. And the idea is that we see decreased activation when we're retaliating, because basically, um, if you retaliate, you're spending money, you're losing money, and you'll also lose the money that you might otherwise have got. The more that you, sp you spend, the poorer, um, the more that you retaliate, the poorer your outcomes are. Now, we had three groups. We had groups that were specifically associated with reactive aggression, that's the middle group. And then we had the uh, more instrumental group that, um, that Nora was talking to you just before. That group of children with conduct problems who are also selectively problematic for reactive aggression, they lash out, they're emotionally labile, they were showing this heightened amygdala and PAG, this bottom end of the threat circuitry response when they were retaliating. Healthy individuals show this, uh, recruit this architecture, but these children recruit it way, way stronger when they're retaliating, even than youth with the same types of behavioral problems, but not just showing this level of reactive aggression. In addition to that, that ventral medial sort of control region, that representing how bad your choices are, that healthy individuals have this nice suppression when you're basically making a really uncunning choice, children with DBD, particularly those with increased levels of reactive aggression, don't show that suppressive response. They're not regulating their behavior, they're not representing how bad this choice is for them to do. And I think I've probably massively oversp overspent no, my... Good. Yeah, we're good? Okay, well, I have try. In, if I haven't seen too many angry faces just about to launch across the table and frustrating how much they would like to get to reception rather than hearing the talk, I'll, I, I'll, I'll take it as red. So I apologize if I'm a little bit overrunning. We're supposed to, I stuck a few extra things that... Yeah, anyway, whatever. What can I do? <laughs> so, um, so, you've seen trauma having this effect on the circuitry. The fact is, and we see these different groups of individuals with conduct problems according to um, um, uh, whether they're this anxiety group, whether this non-anxiety group. And one of our, clue, our clear signals for the non-anxiety group up till now has been the presence of callous on emotional traits. Now, in the literature, there's been uh, a few people out there who've been saying that, look, if you find individuals present who've had high levels of trauma, but who are also showing high levels of callous on emotional traits, they're very different from those individuals who have callous on emotional traits, but don't show high levels of trauma. I have to say, I always thought the people telling me this were just talking nonsense. I was quite convinced they were wrong, and it was just a problem of assessment rather than a problem of, of um, any, uh, you know, anything else. But I have to say, sometimes I'm wrong, as much as I hate to think about it, but it does happen, and I was completely wrong in this particular circumstance. So that's the study we're going to talk about now. 
Basically, this is another Boys Town sample. Um, uh, the, um, this task is the, uh, a very classic um, stimulator of the amygdala. You just look at faces, and it, they're different levels of morphed intensity, and the stronger the fear of the face, the stronger the face looks distressed, the greater your amygdala response. That's a healthy response. Everybody in this room, if I was showing you these pictures, the more fearful the face, the greater your amygdala response. You see a nice, nice relationship. And as uh, Laura was telling you about, the classic finding has been that the more callous unemotional traits you show, the less amygdala response you show to these distress cues. That's been a very classic finding in the literature. But again, like I've just been saying, when we were in NIH, we couldn't work with children who had high levels of abuse. Many of the other groups who've been doing the imaging work have not been working with children who've experienced high levels of abuse. Here we were able to actually examine children who had high levels of abuse versus those who didn't, and also having these callous and emotional traits. So in the green is the very classic finding. In the low trauma group, the more uh, callous and emotional traits the individual shows, the greater, the, the less the amygdala response, the less responsive the person is. So the classic story applies to this group, that individuals um, with reduced amygdala responding don't care so much about other individuals, more likely to do instrumental aggression, more likely to harm other individuals to meet their goals. What was new though, we had this high trauma group, and in the high trauma group, that didn't follow. We do not see um, uh, a, um, a, uh, a relationship between trauma and uh, between callous on emotional traits and reductions in amygdala activity. And in fact, at the very highest trauma levels, you actually see the opposite effect. So high, very high trauma level in the person, the more callous on emotional traits the child is showing, the greater the amygdala response the child is showing to distress cues. So just like that story of the hyper threats, um, um, this apply, the hyper threat story applies to that child, even though on the, on the surface they're showing the symptoms that we've really associated previously with the low threat. And so again, as I sort of began this talk, the emphasis on really not worrying so much about what the person says, but really pushing to a neurobiologically based individualized assessment so we understand what their brain is not doing so well with or what their brain is responding atypically to and go after that in our treatment rather than just going off on what people are saying or even their caregivers are saying that they're struggling with. Also in this task, what we did was, uh, with all of these children, came back for a second visit where we did, we just looked at their, how they evaluated um, uh, um, antisocial actions. And so basically, um, uh, you know, this is the sort of, um, these sort of little vignettes. So a new kid at school, uh, coming down the hall, bumps into your shoulder hard, knocking your books to the floor. A laugh, uh, kid laughs while you walk down the hallway and accidentally trip. Um, all of these things you're asked how to evaluate how, um, what your uh, motives are, what, your, what behaviors you endorse. And so, do you want to avoid problems? Do you want to sort of show dominance? Do you want to retaliate? And uh, here we see that, yeah, so for avoiding conflict, reconciliation, trying to make it up, dominance or revenge, retaliating to what they've done to you, uh, um, and forced respect, making sure the person actually realizes who indeed is the boss here and that they shouldn't be laughing at you if, you've, um, if something bad has happened to you. What you see in the classic relationship with callous on emotional traits, the more callous on emotional traits you have, the, more, uh, the, the less you're bothered about avoiding conflict. You're quite happy to bash them. Um, um, uh, you don't really care about avoiding conflict. In addition, though, the more callous and emotional traits, the more endorsement of revenge, the more likely they, the individuals say they are to retaliate. And in some respects, that's a bit surprising. This fits very nicely with the idea that you're indifferent to the distress of other individuals, you're indifferent to the harm it might cause, and so therefore you really don't care about avoiding conflict. But we've been talking about the retaliation, the revenge, as a heightened amygdala response story. So what we did was um, uh, look within the groups, the low trauma group and the high trauma group. And then we're looking at the relationship between the individual's amygdala response and the extent to which they endorsed these norms. So in the low trauma group, the clear significant finding was that the, in the low trauma group, the more that you responded 
to distress within the amygdala, the more that you wanted to avoid conflict. So the more that you were bothered about another person suffering, the more you just didn't want to make a fight about this, the more you did not want to hurt another individual when these sort of provocative circumstances came up. But the high trauma relationship was very different. In the high trauma group, the more your amygdala responded to, and it responded very strongly indeed, the more you wanted to lash out, the more you wanted to retaliate, the more you wanted revenge, the more you endorsed revenge motives, your enthusiasm to harm another individual. So again, we're seeing these types of brain level um, uh, issues reflecting in the individual's behavior, even at the same time there's very similar surface descriptions of what's going on. So this was the framework we outlined. Um, uh, it gets progressively more complicated, talk about empathy, instrumental aggression, conduct problems, and we talked about issues relating to increased threat response, and then we could get more complicated still with the, it, some of the later findings with trauma. So the core things I would like to get concluded here are that there are very clear, different neurocognitive impairments giving rise to very similar behavioral symptoms. We see this hyper-threat response giving rise to antisocial behavior, but we see a hypo-threat, or at least an indifference to um, others' distress, giving rise to antisocial behavior. The motivations, one is bothering about the distresser or not bothering about the distress of other individuals, so being much, able to, much more able to use aggression to achieve your goals, much more disinterested in avoiding conflict, much more re you know, ready to actually just initiate conflict. Um, but then there's this other group who show this heightened threat response, who are much more likely to be reactive aggression, uh, show reactive aggression, it's lashing out when they're, when they're frightened or frustrated, and in addition, show this endorsement of retaliatory uh, 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 motivations. And again, if we're not assessing the individual's underlying problems, we're not going to be helping the child, we're not going to target the intervention effectively. We could say we should target on conduct disorder and have everybody with conduct disorder have the same, di uh, same intervention, but that clearly isn't working. We've got two different problems in children with conduct, if, if not more, but we've certainly got two different problems that are underpinning the individual's uh, difficulties. We need to target that intervention. Even if we get a more rarefied group of those individuals with conduct disorder and callous on emotional traits, if we're not including wor worries about trauma, we're not assessing threat sensitivity to them, we're still back to the same problem. We need to be getting these individualized assessment techniques in order to target interventions for the specific difficulties faced by the children. And I'll end there. Thanks very much, and I'm sorry. Or is everybody desperate for reception? Oh. <laughs> so, uh, why do you think that using the scanner, you're able to uh, assess how the person is behaving, and then draw some conclusions about what their condition might be? Yeah. So, if you were looking at a person who, and the terminology that you might be described as a sociopath, mm -hmm. and you look at another one who might be described as a psychopath, would you be able to look at that brain? And, and draw conclusions about them in that particular That's context. where we want this narrative to go. It's not there yet. I mean, right now, what we're doing is we're collecting data in order to develop these assessment tools based on brain imaging, but um, we don't have it in this particular context. One of our collaborators has it really nicely, potentially, for pain. So he's identified um, a neural signature associated with pain. And the reason why that's really useful is it means that if you've got, I mean, the, I, I deal with the judges on period of they find this deeply entertaining because it means suddenly we're in a situation where somebody is claiming personal injury and experience pain and you can actually get an objective measure of whether their brain is signaling this pain signal. So yes, we want to be in that situation. We think it's definitely theoretically doable given this pain work. We haven't done it yet. But, but that's what I do for voice chat. If I haven't, can't do this, I've made such a terrible career run that it's untrue. Because <laughs> I've made it from a totally safe job to a non-safe job. It's a really bad idea. But I hope this is going to work, and I really hope we can do some good. So. Um, if there's such an obvious difference between um, the
with that. Um, I'm not I, I guess I'm not understanding um, why they're receiving the diagnosis they are. If, if they have experienced trauma, but are they not, why are they not receiving a PTSD diagnosis? Or just kind of where where in the diagnostic is, is this kind of going wrong? Or why, why is the confusion coming? Well, so experience of trauma is not the same as having PTSD. Mm -hmm. Lots of people yeah. experience high level of trauma do not have. I mean, uh, the percentage is depending on the type of trauma, but you don't necessarily develop the symptoms set of PTSD. But again, we're back to this fundamental problem that when we're doing with PTSD, it's really what I'm reporting. You know, am I reporting avoiding circumstances associated with the trauma? Am I reporting avoidance behaviors? Am I reporting yet X or Y? Or is somebody reporting on my behalf? As opposed to looking at the underlying um, um, uh, mechanism. So, you know, it's, it's um, 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 we're probably in. I mean, you see it, see it in the literature, it gets really odd. I mean, people talk about watching a trauma on TV and developing PTSD from it. That doesn't make much sense from a neurobiological point of view, unless there was a pre existing condition and this is just re upping the situation. That, that's certainly the case. But developing a full blown PTSD with no history, no, doesn't make any sense. But yeah, you see it all the time. And people will diagnose on those things, you know, on the way the person talks about it. But again, we really need to look at the underlying pathology. Okay. So that is some of the reason for these difficulties. Then I have a follow up question. Yeah. In your opinion, um, what is the changes that could, uh, could or need to, need to be changed in the diagnostic criteria? Because there is such a clear difference. Um, uh, like between the, the um, neurobiology, uh, uh, neurocognitive impairments. Uh, so, we, we, so it's two things. So, so right now, you're, we've, the system in this country means I have a, a smile because I don't have this, but I'm, a, I'm a European, one of these terrible Europeans. But we have a rather different healthcare system in Europe. And, uh, and the system here, you know, the business, you have to go through insurance. If you go through insurance, you need a diagnosis. If you don't have a diagnosis, we cannot, under any circumstances, get rid of the DSM now because too many people will be massively badly detrimentally affected. What I want as an augmentation to DSM is to have these individualized assessment techniques so that we actually do see that, you know, we, like we asked the previous question, in an individuals reporting PTSD, do we see hyper threat secretary activity in this individual? Or are they maybe reporting something, maybe they're depressed and they think it's PTSD, or they've read about PTSD and they express this, but they're actually feeling something, you know, there's all sorts of possibilities. Um, so we get to a, we, we basically say, yeah, this is what they report, so we're gonna look for these systems in particular, and we do indeed see X, Y, and Z detrimentally the effect of this individual, and we really need to start doing something about those systems. And we've got the measures of those systems to see whether they're pulled back into line. I mean, just that, you know, the, very few people here are going to be worried about the blood pressure thing. You know, having a blood pressure test that means that you don't want to go to your MD and say, um, I'm feeling high blood pressure today. You want them to take the blood pressure measurement, and you want to see that the intervention you give them for the blood pressure is bringing your blood pressure down. Um, and we want to be in that sort of situation for mental health. So it's not to get rid of the DSM in the short term because we critically need it for insurance and the way that um, um, healthcare is funded in this, in this country, to a certain extent, place world, but particularly here right now. But we definitely need much, much better tools for targeting intervention. Thank you. Any more?